Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Victorian Space Science Education Centre. My name is uh, Mike Phillips and I'm a lecturer in Digital Technologies and STEM Education at Monash University. If you're feeling like you just made it to Mars, hang on and just wait to see what we've got in store for you a little bit later on tonight. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners and custodians of the land on which we meet today, the Wurundjeri people uh, of the Kulin Nation. I pay my respects to their elders, both past and present. I'd also like to introduce uh, our panel of speakers for tonight. Uh, at the far end, we have Michael Pakakis. Michael is the director of this fantastic facility, and he's got a lot to share with you in just a few minutes' time. Uh, at this end, we have Gary Bass, who is the 2016 DLTV Leader of the Year and President of the Magnet Association of STEM Educators. Uh, next to Michael, we have Sean Elliott. Sean is a science communicator, writer, and STEM educator. And sitting in front of his computer is Roland Guesthusen, and he is a uh, STEM method lecturer and professional practice consultant at Monash University. So we're here tonight to uh, put the T back into STEM. There we go. We're here to put the, the T into STEM. Our focus is on the digital technologies in STEM education. As I mentioned, I lecture in STEM. My focus is really on digital technologies. And one of the things that fascinates me is the way that digital technologies have become such a big part of our day-to-day -day lives. I love this particular quote. The need to know the capital of Florida died when my phone learned the answer. It's from a teenage student in America. And digital technologies are a massive part of the day-to-day -day lives of the young people that we teach here in Victoria. Let's just have a really quick look at what's actually going on in terms of digital technologies. <clears throat> Here are some statistics from January last year that the, the uh, 2017 stats aren't out quite yet. But if you have a look at the, the uh, number of people that are now connected to the internet, we've nearly got 50% of the global population connected to the internet. That's quite extraordinary. And when you look at the number of unique mobile phone users, we've actually got over 50% of people on this planet now using mobile phones. That's remarkable when you think about what was going on 15 years ago. If we take a bit of a look a little bit closer to home, we can actually see that mobile subscriptions, and that's not just for mobile phones, but if we think about for tablet devices as well, actually exceed the population here in Australia. We have got more mobile subscriptions than we do people in this country. So chances are there are a number of students in your classrooms who've actually got multiple mobile devices. Um, smartphone ownership here in Australia reached 84% uh, late 2016. So we've got over 20 million uh, smartphones here in Australia. And when you think Apple actually released their iPhone first in 2008, it's a pretty remarkable statistic. What do you reckon the percentage of smartphone ownership is in the age bracket 18 to 24? If overall we've got 84%, is it higher or lower than that, do you think? Higher? Yeah, anyone want to give me a number? 99%. Wow. Could be. Anyone want to give me another one? 95. Do I hear 94? No. Because <laughs> you would be right if you told me 94. No, but that's pretty remarkable, isn't it? 94% of people in that age bracket in this country have a smartphone. That's incredible when you think about that in just 10 years. So digital technologies are a really big deal for young people both inside and outside of school. But when we look at a lot of the time what goes on in schools, we actually see this kind of thing going on. Things that might have been happening in the 1950s and 60s, teachers checking students' work, and similar kinds of practices going on in schools today. A lot of research is showing that the possibilities that are offered by digital technologies may not actually necessarily be realised as much as we might like them to be. And that not, is not just inside a school as well. That a lot of the cultural practices that we might have had standing around on the street corner 100 years ago well, we might have replaced the, the horse and cart with a horseless carriage on a train line, but our technology practices are not dissimilar. 
And that's led some people like my colleague at Monash, Professor Neil Selwyn, to talk about this cycle of hype, hope and disappointment that comes with the promise of digital technologies. There's a lot of hype that we uh, think that fantastic things are going to happen. And we hope that if we hang on just for a little bit longer, we might realise what some of those things are. And ultimately, this can potentially lead to disappointment. But that's enough of the doom and gloom. We're here tonight to actually celebrate technologies and what they can actually do. And we're here to show you some fantastic and amazing things that you can do with technologies in STEM education. And what I want to do before I hand over uh, to Michael is to give you an idea about the ways in which effective STEM educators in so many contexts actually uh, introduce technologies into their classroom practice. And that's using this kind of an idea. So I'm going to give you a bit of theory and what I'd like you to do is to try to come back to that theory as the evening progresses and as you hear of these fantastic examples from our wonderful four presenters tonight. <clears throat> this is a framework that um, the two guys down in the bottom right hand corner in the picture there, uh, Hunya Mishra and Matt Kaler came up with in 2006. And they said that fantastic educators need to know the content that they're teaching. They have to have content knowledge. There's no point in going into a physics classroom if you don't know physics. And that's why I don't teach physics. <laughs> but the thing that separates a physics teacher from a physicist is that the physics teacher has fantastic pedagogical knowledge. The physics teacher knows how to represent the content for particular students at a particular point in time for a particular purpose. That's what makes a, a great teacher. But in contemporary classrooms, Matt and Punya argued, great teachers also have to have technological knowledge. They have to understand the relationship between technology and content how technology can change the way that we represent content. But we also have to understand how technologies can change the way that we engage with the young people that we have in front of us. That looking at this kind of an idea, Punya, Matt and myself have worked for a number of years and shown that if we consider these th three forms of knowledge in context, then we can get some amazing results that happen when teachers have technological, pedagogical and content knowledge or TPAC. But don't be fooled. Even though the technology comes first in TPAC, the technology is not by itself the most important thing. The relationship between the technology and the pedagogy and the technology and the content is also really, really important. So that's why I'm going to leave the bit of theory. But if you're starting to get interested in that, you would have received one of these tonight. Uh, and we've got another free uh, opportunity in November for you to come along and hear more about TPAC and its precursor PCK. But I'm going to hand over to Michael Pakakis, who is the director of the Victorian Space Education Centre. And he's going to tell you some amazing things about the way that he's been working with technologies uh, in this particular STEM context. Thank you very much for that. Um, it, it, it's interesting that you um, approached your introduction in this particular way because that Venn diagram um, that was put up is basically the basis um, of the programs or um, if I could use the word, the guts behind the programs that we developed here at VSEC. Um, those three areas, uh, as was explained, um, are probably the most important areas in terms of trying to get the technology to be used correctly in the classroom, uh, but also to have the knowledge behind the technology and also how to actually teach um, not only the knowledge, but also the technology and use the technology. And one of the emphases that I want to make um, um, today when I do the presentation is that, um, as was said, technology, and I think you guys, when you went around the place, or you're going to get a, a really detailed tour um, pretty soon, but <clears throat> the one thing the, the reason why we've actually uh, pumped this place with technology um, is that that competitive factor that we have out there um, in society with what was explained in terms of every person or 95 percent of people have a smartphone and all those type of things because that's that's what we're competing with in terms of trying to get students engaged in the classroom um, so we have to engage with that technology we have to make that technology relevant um, to those students in the classroom and use that technology um, to teach them what we want to teach. 
uh, more, <coughs> excuse me, more effectively. I have to also apologise because I've got a very sore throat. Um, uh, the Victorian Space Science Education Centre, um, as you can see, is quite a remarkable um, building. Um, it was um, uh, conceived on paper uh, by myself uh, back in 2000. Um, uh, a proposal was put into government uh, and government uh, decided that yes, this was a, a really excellent idea in order to promote STEM and teach STEM across um, uh, Victoria. But the beauty about it was that um, when at the time um, there were another two proposals and since then there were another three proposals. So VSEC has become part of Vic STEM. Um, Vic STEM is made up of six. So there's six specialist science centres in Victoria. We um, teach science right across the board under this umbrella or context of space. Uh, the other centres specialise in particular areas, environmental sustainability, um, genetic engineering, <coughs> um, uh, geoscience and uh, biomechanics and, and uh, uh, I think it's, yeah, I think biomechanics. $6.4 million building budget, built on time and on budget. Um, 2006 was the original opening. Um, last year we had about 14,000 students come into the place. Um, last year was also the year that we broke 100,000 students since it opened. Um, so it has become an extremely popular uh, place for students to come. And I think one of the main reasons is that we've made sure that every single program that we design um, is directly linked to the standards in Victoria and also what is actually being taught in the classroom. So, we can, so teachers can see the relevance and they can see the connection between what they do in the classroom and how we can support them uh, when their students come here to do a program. Um, three and a half thousand outreach students uh, these are targeted to low socioeconomic areas. Uh, we actually go out to those uh, schools. We model a lesson. We've chosen um, a series of science concepts which we um, have identified as quite difficult for those teachers to teach, especially in the primary sector. And we, we go there with all of our equipment and teach the lesson and model the lesson on best practice. And we actually leave the equipment there for that teacher to repeat that lesson many times over. Um, professional learning. Professional learning was identified as probably one of the most important things that this centre um, can provide teachers in Victoria. And we've been running now since 2009, uh, uh, roughly, I think it was the first year we had about three or 400 teachers come through the centre and now we're reaching um, this figure of about eight to 900 teachers doing professional learning um, every year through the centre. And also we have a number of international groups, so we're, we're quite well known internationally. Sometimes we think we're sort of more known internationally than we are locally, but that's another story. <laughs> um, now, the best way for us to actually um, transfer this knowledge that we had in terms of pedagogy and also um, conceptual learning, because that's what we want, we want to concentrate on. We don't want to overemphasize content. We want to, we want to emphasize understanding of concepts was to create what we refer to as scenario-based learning. So therefore students, when they come here, actually are embedded into a scenario. All the activities that they do, all the roles that they play are again, as I, as I stressed before, are directly linked to what is being taught in the classroom at the time. The Mars program, I've got a pointer, yes I do. Does it work? Yep. The Mars program will see students um, become astronauts and they go on the surface, simulated surface of Mars to do an analog mission, geological mission on Mars. Then they will convert <coughs> into engineers up in mission control and then they will convert into research scientists in the laboratory. So they do a number of different things all linked to Year 8 and Year 9 Earth Science that is being taught um, right across Victoria. Um, the Space Lab, you saw the, um, the nice um, video where it transports primary school students to a Mars base. That's the Space Lab that they will go to and that's um, where they'll have a series of activities that they will complete, um, which are investigations, again, related to um, the standards that they're being taught. 
The other program which we're very, very proud of, and I won't talk too much about it now because I've got a special slide for it, is our robotics mission. Um, the other thing that scenario based, and we did a lot of research in this particular area, was that it enabled us to promote and teach the four C's, right? Um, which are regarded as 21st century skills. And all of the programs have these embedded in them. And there's quite a bit of emphasis um, to the teacher that this is what we're trying to actually um, uh, transfer to the student, to be able to communicate, to be able to collaborate, to critically think, to be creative. Um, so mission control and um, technology has been, been talked about tonight a lot. Um, this is what we started off with. <coughs> it's a game. It's actually a game. Um, it feels like a game. It works like a game. But it, it has embedded what we refer to as pedagogical agents in the game. So therefore, there is a lot of problem solving uh, activities embedded within the mission control software, um, which allows students to apply their knowledge that they have been taught in the classroom. So this is an exercise of application of knowledge. Most of it, most of those problem solving activities, how much time have I got? Five minutes? Five minutes? Jeez, I better move it. I talk too much, sorry. Um, um, is they're all mathematically based problems. This is what it looked like, this is what it looks like now. Again, trying to compete with the technology out there. So we made it a little bit more flashier uh, for the students to interact with, uh, a little bit more relevant, um, and, but the software is still, the guts of it is still a game based. Um, research lab, as I explained to you before, the students will go into a research lab, they will do the analysis of all the samples that they've collected on the surface of Mars and come up with conclusions. And the main thing that we're after there is for them to actually tell us the story of what happened in this simulated crater over the last three billion years, okay? Um, primary schools uh, will experience, as you can see there, the excitement of students, the engagement, um, again, the, the interacting with the technology uh, for their Mars base uh, program. Um, I think I mentioned that before, uh, the lab. <coughs> robotics mission, robotics mission, this particular program took five years of my life to put together. Um, it was an extremely hard um, uh, program to put together because it was one of the, one of the first very true STEM um, project-based learning programs. Um, it allows you to convert any computer lab in any school, in anywhere, any part of the world into a robotics mission control and control our robot on our surface. Um, and you will see when you have a tour, um, and when we get to that, that stage, I'll explain a little bit more about the program because if I do now, it'll take me another five, 10 minutes to do that. Um, we, 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 we have been extremely fortunate that we've had um, Lockheed Martin come on board in the last 12 months um, to give us um, assistance in writing um, curriculum. Um, so we've written a, um, uh, a STEM project-based learning program that teachers can actually teach um, over, a, over a, a term in their class, culminating to a mission um, to Mars, a robotic mission to Mars here at, um, at VSEC. <clears throat> Pedagogically, this is what we base our pedagogy on. Um, it goes back about 20 or 30 years of research in terms of how students learn and how actually people learn. Um, and, and, we, and also the accumulation of all of these texts is basically that huge uh, meta-analysis that Professor John Hattie did um, a few years back identifying something like over 125 different strategies that teachers teach and narrowing it down to about nine of, of most effective um, teaching strategies and this is what we embed in the curriculum that we develop and the lesson plans that we develop and hand over to teachers. Um, international partnerships, we have been extremely lucky um, that um, our work has been recognised as I said um, right at the beginning internationally and it's allowed us to become partners um, with a, um, uh, what we refer to as the, Inter as the International Space Education Board 
which allows us contact with the heads of education of most of the space agencies around the world. This has led to us um, working closely with NASA Ames and the chief scientists of NASA Ames, which has actually led to probably the first type of um, curriculum um, focusing on quantum computing, not quantum physics, but quantum computing, um, which is being now taught at year 10 level. Um, so we're quite proud of, proud of that. It, that. That was a two year effort um, of, the, um, of the staff here and also the staff over at NASA Ames. Um, I think I've gone over, so that's okay. Thank you very much. Um, my brief in this is to talk about um, citizen science. Um, the organisation I'm associated with was originally the seventh science centre, which was a virtual science and technology centre established at the same time as uh, VSEC, um, GTAC and Ecolink. Uh, funding for Magnet ceased in 2000, I believe. So the, for teachers, the art of science and teaching can be an isolating experience and often the only means of improving the teaching and the learning for students is by networking. So mentoring has been a large part just luck. Even in Victoria, which is relatively small, and ironically I'm teaching at a place called distance education and in Victoria I mentioned that to people from Queensland, West Australia, uh, South Australia and they don't believe that Victoria has distance at all. So uh, isolation is not only in physical distance, it's also in larger institutions. So in large schools, um, quite often staff can be isolated. So quite often it's teacher relationships that are the key to improving teaching as much as the content knowledge. So there's a report from um, universities Australia, which highlighted, we'll work this out by the end, um, that in too many schools STEM is still mostly science mathematics because that traditionally is what we've done. We know how to do it, we know how to do it reasonably well if at the end of it we have a test. Um, the whole idea of standards is a little bit new. Um, it's only been running here in Victoria now 20 years. Um, New South Wales is starting standards this year, their first significant change in 25 years. So the Australian curriculum is an emerging idea. Um, so the STEM movement's been around for a very long time, um, but the implementation of that uh, remains to be seen. Uh, an example of the magnet approach uh, is probably summed up by this uh, quote um, where active learning is the way to learn. You actually have to do it. Um, the old idea of cognitive overload where you've got too much to do and not enough time to do it uh, forces you to make choices and set priorities. And if it's too easy, you probably won't learn things. Um, but the end point for this is um, no more lectures and there must be a better way. Um, coincidentally, there's a thing called the GLOBE program, which stands for, I could never remember what it is, but fortunately there's a subheading there that tells us that it's global learning and observations to benefit the environment. Um, this has also been going uh, 20 years, um, and it's the base of citizen science. It was launched in 1994, and launched in Australia in 1995. And it turns out that uh, I think there were 30 teachers at that launch, two of whom are sitting at this table, at this end of the table, which is a little bit curious, um, because it was all about embedding the learning. You actually did something useful and learnt how you did it on the way. So Roland and I met in Canberra 20 years ago uh, at the GLOBE training program. Um, Coincidentally, um, in 2012, the funding with, was withdrawn by the Australian government and we're now coordinated by New Zealand. 
<laughs> Thank you, New Zealand. <laughs> <laughs> we can go to Auckland instead of going to Canberra, so that might be a benefit. Um, you going to catch up? Yeah, okay. Um, I'll let people read that. What is it? It's an international science and education program. It's available to anyone anywhere. So rather than travelling to Strathmore, which is a wonderful place and it's a fantastic facility, there needs to be the hybrid of the online and the <laughs> Uh, in place and coming to terms with how to run a hybrid program is now the challenge for all of us because um, we can do the face to face and out of the way and I'll show you and okay now you can do it approach um, easy to choose easy to see I'm a physics teacher um, we don't explain very well we can show very well but we don't explain very well and the online requires a lot better explaining um, the globe stats, there are 117 countries involved. Um, this month there's over 400,000 measurements taken. Um, and this is with Australia not really there. Um, the next slide I think I've got is something that we set up um, originally in 1994. One of the schools I was involved with used a computer to automate its data collection and it's been running continuously since 2001, taking a measurement every 15 minutes in uh, temperature, dew point, wind speed, direction, rainfall, air pressure, wind chill, UV, solar radiation. We've now got a continuous record for 20 years. So if you want to talk about weather and climate change, um, that school's got some data to talk about it. What's changed, what's the same? There wasn't a network called Earthwatch that had um, Earthwatch and Airwatch, which was run by EPA at the time, um, and they set up a network of schools. But the thing with uh, weather stations these days is for about $20 you can build your own. So it's really a question of, well, what are we learning? Where are we learning it? How are we learning it? What's a good thing to do? And something close to where the students live is probably an essential part of that. However, moving off planet, <coughs> Previously, there's a project called EarthCam. It's now renamed Sally Ride EarthCam. Sally Ride was the first educator in space, first teacher to go into space. Um, and they honour her with that. And she did a fantastic amount of development of on the ground activities to complement the in the space activities. So the deal is that there's a Nikon 12 megapixel camera, which isn't a lot. The current megapixels are running around 24 but you don't need a really big camera to take some really good photos. And so the idea is you've got a camera sitting there connected to a computer and it's controlled from the ground. So the deal is the, te the teachers are organised the mission, the students get a ticket for their one photo and they've got to choose when and where and what are they pointing it at and why. And just the discussion about if you could take a photo from space, where would you take it and why? and what time of day and what time of year and just all those discussions of what does it look like and the other thing that you notice by taking photos from space is there are no borders which is pretty handy so the the lineup is pretty simple there's really only five steps in it uh, it's free access and if you took notice of the address which is earthcam.org I think It'll be on the bottom of the next slide. Uh, you can sign up, well now, if you want to look down to your connected smartphone um, and be connected up for the mission um, that's on this month. So there's a gallery of all the previous photos, there's several hundred thousand photos there, every time of day, every time of year from nearly everywhere on the planet, but not everywhere yet. And the thing is, just a simple Nikon camera can take some amazingly detailed uh, images. This is just an animated GIF, so you can make your own slideshow of your photos. Uh, the thing with Google Earth is it was taken in time, it's a moment in time, this would be taken now. So that's a little bit exciting. Um, there's a whole bunch of activities, huge amount of activities associated with it. If you want EarthCam to take over your life, uh, you can allow that to happen, for not only just for this year, but for several years. 
Uh, and that's the danger with a lot of these projects in that they are so good uh, for some people that's all they want to do. And you need to actually ration when and where and for how long. And what you can do is you can just hand it over to the students because it becomes about empowering the students. The engagement's looked after. It's about handing over the tools to the students and letting them run with it. So the next mission is September 25, coincidentally our holidays, but I mean, that's a bit irrelevant. Um, it's off the planet and the idea is that the students are given a certain set of numbers, they're not allowed to spend it once and they have to choose uh, when and where and be careful is it night or day because taking a photo at night <laughs> is not all that useful and taking the photo when it's cloudy is not all that useful. You get a, a very white. So the, the, there's a lot of failures, but you only learn through failure, so I'm told. Um, another one where we probably head for rather than we can actually do is a thing called CubeSat, which is more tertiaries, but we've got to start somewhere. One of my students started playing with one of the early data loggers in 96 when we first started doing this data capture. He ended up doing the first year at Mechatronics, building his own helicopter and importing that to the United States when he went over there to work. Um, was a bit difficult because it had a wingspan of two metres. Helicopter, had a payload of 20 kilo. Um, he now is a director of the Microsat project uh, at NASA. So he started in outer suburbs of Melbourne and he had a bit of a dream and he followed it and he just did stuff. So this is the next doing stuff, is making your own satellites. So the idea is to get a team of four or five engineers, software engineers, the whole lot. This is designed for tertiary. It's a bit serious, but it's something we can certainly talk about. What can you put in a 10 by 10 cube? And it's launched by pushing it off the space station. That's how they launch it. There's no rocket. They're not allowed to use inf uh, flammables because it might go wrong. So they're allowed to use cold gas or they can just push it, um, which is the safe way to launch it. And the other one I'll just mention in passing is um, HAB or high altitude balloons, weather balloons. If we'd launched a balloon from here yesterday, that's where it would have gone. So there's a predictor of where the balloons will go. Um, building the sensors that go on that are relatively straightforward and for not very much money, it used to be several hundreds, but it's a lot less than that now, it would be possible to send up your own low earth uh, launch vehicle. Um, Magnet, the organisation of which I'm associated, has a Facebook page, STEM Australia, where you need to be quick to see the stuff as it scrolls off the bottom of the page. There's so many contributors that it just scrolls off. There's no indexing. There's no lookups. Um, if you miss a week, then it's gone, but someone else will put some more things there. As current, uh, as of last night, the current membership is 560 um, plus coming from a zero um, 18 months ago. Mm -hmm. So it was originally STEM Victoria, but there's so many people from the other states interested, we said, what the heck? And there's a lot of people from beyond Australia interested as well, but we're reluctant to let the next generation standards take over our conversations. So we want to talk about Australian curriculum or Vic curriculum. And if the others want to join in, well, that's good for them. But um, if you're interested, STEM Australia, it's a moderated group. If you try and sell anything, you'll be blocked. Um, if you want to recommend someone else's stuff, that's fine. Yeah. But if you're selling your own gear, then you can go somewhere else. Go to uh, STEM Teaching Australia, which is New South Wales, and they'll be full of advertising. But we can do without that. We want to talk about the pedagogy, not about the good deal with the latest, because the flashy things tend not to last. Thanks for your time, and I hope that's of some interest. mag.net.org.au. Mag the original name of that was from Magnificent Network, uh, and we still think that that's probably the best way teachers learn. Ask the question get the answer, ask another question, share a contact, meet at a conference, meet at an evening like this, you might have found your new best buddy for the next few months um, because they've got something to share. Uh, I've noticed Victorian teachers are incredibly generous with their time and what they know and the people
people here tonight, the organisers here tonight, are examples of that. Thanks for your time. I took the trouble to suit up. <laughs> but this is going to be quite a big slide and you've got a long way to go. So could you please make sure that you're seated correctly, up straight, your seat belts are correctly fastened and clipped in and your mobiles are turned off. We are about to commence the ride. We start from 1997. It was a time when we had the Sojourno rover crawling across Mars. That was the first one and um, it was quite exciting to watch it mount a rock. It was a time when I had hair. It was a time when I was a real nerd and a geek. I actually came from industry into education, um, making the move from just around the corner here, working with uh, Orica in organic chemicals and then down at Deer Park and explosives, to the safe world of education. I went to Westall. Um, Westall's a unique school. Um, it's the only one that has three electrical pylons on the school property, which is really special, um, and the double rainbow. Um, we have to the north um, asbestos blowing in across the uh, estate. Um, we also have um, Alex on the roof, he's the caretaker. He used to work at the plant, the Nissan plant up there. Um, and I was a new teacher first, um, in charge of everything. They began with F, photocopiers, flags, and the, f and the network, which they'd call in various names of F. Um, you can see Alex is a wonderful caretaker. He brings all his construction skills. Um, that's actually made up of old school desks. Um, and we mounted our first weather station on the roof of the school. Um, amazing guy. And we had a lot of luck with that. Um, <coughs> I'm going, going up every now and then because the magpies would peck at this and poo in there and I'd have to clean the tipping bucket rain gauge. But some wonderful science data. Um, we were part of the Globe mission, as you heard, and it was about <coughs> collecting, doing hands-on science. Um, we had to put everything into a steel cage at Westall. <laughs> as interesting as it is, um, this is our digital camera. It was all that we had for our budget. Um, it was a way of engaging with the world. Um, that was it. Um, it was all we needed. Um, we w had um, a project we made some paper balances for. Um, that was quite exciting. That was, ex that was the extent of our digital budget back then. If you wanted more, you had to collect Safeway shopper dockets. <laughs> Um, this was a magnet project um, of connecting schools up with um, the internet. And magnet was about free stuff. It, it, um, we had our camera, um, we had the initiative and the idea, and here we are chatting to our principal of the Japanese sister school. Um, and you look at the year, 1995, 97. We went to Science Week, were invited. They'd heard that we were cutting edge technology. And um, when we turned up, um, it was a little scary because um, we had schools that had plasticized fish dissections and we had all sorts of wonderful things and all we had was a web camera. Um, <laughs> but what was authentic was the learning that was happening here. And I met a really wonderful guy who came in and spoke to the students about what doing. I said, this is, this is really good. I love the learning. Does anyone know this guy? <laughs> yeah. It was a wonderful memory um, and I liked the fact that he talked to the kids in a really authentic way as a teacher, asking <laughs> questions, pushing the boundaries, never happy. And actually he broke away from his ministerial pack and ducked into the back of the tent and sat down with them and asked them more questions, um, which was really good. <laughs> So twice each year at our school, something really special happens. And what happens at our school is this. The light streams right down the corridor and strikes the cleaner's cupboard at the very end. Does anyone know what this is called? It's the equinox. Our school is aligned perfectly along the east-west alignment. It's just a coincidence, and it means that we are in perfect alignment with the equinox. We are up there with um, Stonehenge. <laughs> Our school is grounded in astronomy. It was begging us to do something. And in 1769, I've gone back, haven't I? But that's, <laughs> hang on. This happened. Can anyone tell me what's going on here? It's interesting, isn't it? 
Yes, it, it's a clock. Yes, that's right. Yes, that's good. <laughs> it's a clock in a tent. But any clues what it might be? Okay, I'll give you another clue. A clock in a tent in a faraway land. This is not Lord of the Rings. Come on. It's not a swing, no. Um, okay, this guy over here, Joseph Banks. It's a terrible picture because talking about the Indians, showing the, he's not in India, that's not America. Um, it's actually um, an island. Um, and in, it's the transit of Venus across the face of the sun. And it's actually really good science here because what ends up happening, if you could do this from two parts of the world, you can actually do some really good mathematics to work out how far the Earth is from the Sun. And for the British Naval Society, that's really important. We could navigate better and we could claim the world as our own, as the British Empire did, you know, all the way from India, all the parts that were red. But look, what's interesting here, you've got this happening because it happened 2003. Here we am. This is the, it's our budget, the school web camera. We've now got a laptop, so you know, this things are starting to crank forward. And look, the internet's streaming away there. So we could look at the transit of Mercury. Um, I had an extra. Oh, you always plan these things on a daily organizer. Race into the room. Um, we made a pinhole camera. We turned the whole room into an observatory. And it was fantastic. We were watching it happening. We were streaming it out with our camera on the internet. We were kicking ass. And what was exciting for us too was involving the students here and the parents and looking at all of the different connections that we could make about the science and the learning and what we were seeing happening in the school and our place in the universe. So this is really important. And you've got to understand now the anchoring that we actually have. Because in 2004, I had a phone call. Principal says, come to my office. Okay, I've done something <laughs> wrong. I've done my reports and come in there. It's a bloke who wants to talk to you. Okay, what are you doing? So I'm um, making, we, we took rubbish out of the school bins and we made satellites because we're a bit of a cargo cult now. We're into science and kids want to make satellites now. And we're, uh, the school buildings are full of satellites. Like, we've got a whole room with them. Um, if you ever seen my science room, there was the Hubble Space Telescope and everything. It was all strung out in the IT lab. <coughs> This guy wanted to talk to me. I didn't know who he was. He said, I need you to make something. It's from NASA. You can't bullshit NASA. My principal said, I remember that from the dish. So, um, okay, um, send me the instructions. And it came. And back then it was on a fax. Only North Korea's got faxes now. Um, but what was exciting about the fax was that um, it was like something from contact with uh, Jody Foster, where you had this thing to make. We didn't know what we were making, but um, we were making it. So we had the instructions there, and we were working on it. These are the boys um, trying to work out the calculator. Um, and they were quite complicated instructions. This wasn't something just rip off the plan. This was not a flat pack. We had to make it. I had to find some wood. Um, I had to promise to pay the woodwork teacher back. <laughs> so there we are. We've made it. This is obviously some sort of thing. Um, it's got the latitude, the longitude, um, pictures that we stole from the internet. So here we go. And my father said that won't last for two weeks outside. So he got into it as well, um, started to put some perspex on it and stole a bauble off the Christmas tree. <laughs> so we made it. There we are. My daughter makes a couple of appearances here, so watch her. Her hair will appear and mine disappears. <laughs> Ta-da! Done. Now, okay. We stuck her on the roof of the school. I'm looking really sophisticated there. Um, with our school tables that have been reworked into something useful. There's the, we now got a housing for the web camera. We followed the instructions from NASA. It was some sort of sundial and we stuck it on the roof of the school and um, NASA had mucked up. They, they, they'd forgotten something. Um, see, what happened was they'd reversed the instructions for the southern hemisphere, but what they'd forgotten was that when the sun actually bounces off the camera, this is what happens. When we started streaming, that's what we were sending in the day. Oh, that's not Ron. Uh, Australia, can you fix up your camera? So I'm just doing my best here, as we do. And um, unfortunately, what's happening is that the sun is reflecting off the perspex my father had set up into the camera. <laughs> um. <laughs> Did you guys figure this one out? Oh, we didn't. 
Okay, well, um, in the end we raided the Hudson night box from the physics department and we managed to get the filtering working and it was great. So, a bit of Australian ingenuity there. We rescued it just like they did in the dish. Um, but can you see there's a problem here? The time doesn't work. Now, we did those calculations really carefully. Can someone help me here? What have I gotten wrong? Because we, we, we checked those numbers, we checked them twice. It was like Father Christmas and it just didn't come up all that nice. Um, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock? I am here. Daylight saving time, thank you, yeah. But it was good once we took care of the fact that daylight saving time was actually affecting our clocks. We were up and running. We were streaming on the internet. 2006, oh crikey. What had happened was that um, there was one in the British, the British Science Museum, there was one in the Smithsonian, there was one in the observatory in Brazil. We were the Southern Hemisphere reference station for NASA. <laughs> Uh, the problem was that when Bill Knight, the science guy, contacted us, um, he went to the internet, saw the ABC website of the places that were streaming the Mercury Transit. Um, the guy, um, Ian Musgrave, had moved us to the top of this because he could, took pity for us being Westall at the bottom and he thought we were some sort of observatory that was streaming for a university. Um, no, we were a high school. Um, so there we were, uh, on the Planetary Society with our sundial made of wood. Um, everybody else... Um, but not only that, um, I'll just zoom out a little bit here. Um, we were part of the, the Spirit and Opportunity rovers. Um, on the back of the rovers are the sister dial. Um, they've got here, one here. Um, that's on the back of the, uh, I think that's Opportunity. Um, there's one on the uh, Spirit. So we were the Southern Hemisphere reference station for the NASA project for the Mars rovers. We were with the big boys. And it was really quite exciting for us to see how things were changing. You go and visit these sundials and look at our system, it would change. Um, in 25 hours, we would turn from night to day to night, and the timing was different. So in two weeks, it'd cycle and squeeze <coughs> in an extra day. So here we have what it looks like on Mars, and it's still running. Our wood couldn't last it. Um, this thing is still going. So one sun, two planets. 2006, NASA didn't believe what had happened. Deborah Vane had come down from the um, CloudSat mission. She's a mission director. Um, she saw all of the cardboard satellites we had hanging up in her classroom, um, and it was a kicker. Um, I just noticed last night there, all the pizza boxes in the corner. <laughs> <laughs> but you've got to imagine how excited we were as kids. Um, she came down. Um, they left us some equipment. This is a hemispherical dish which we use for ground truthing so that they can actually when the satellite's flying over and it's taking photos down, we can give them the photo from the ground up. And that gives a whole different interpretation to the way that the cloud um, were working. In 2008, I was invited to JPL and to give a talk about how we pulled it off, because we did it quicker than those other big boys. Um, and um, I had a chance to visit the uh, Mars Science Laboratory uh, rover area. It's a wonderful place. And uh, what really excited me was to see this at the back of the rover. <laughs> I can't stop seeing it. Once you've seen it, you'll never unsee it. Um, so I had a chance to see the Vehicle Assembly Building, which is where they um, assemble some of the satellites. And what really excited me as a STEM educator is that they do it by hand. It's not like they just screw together all the McDonnell Douglas parts. No, these guys actually play a part in thinking it through. They handcraft these $200 million satellites. And this guy, um, who actually makes the models, took the trouble to make a model for my students and saying, hi guys, I make models, this is my job, and I'm really about to see what you have done, this is what I do. And it lent a, an air of authenticity to the work that we were doing. So the, when we went to the uh, Deep Space Tracking Station in Canberra, um, I won a science drama project for a, an interpretive dance about the <laughs> universe, which was fun. Um, <laughs> but um, we had a chance to show off the things that we were doing. Um, and this was at the uh, Curiosity rover launch where we had a chance to um, celebrate the next rover that landed on Mars. So it's happening again. Um, 6 of June 2012, we had another transit. In fact, one of those eyes, I forget which one now, was actually the, the shadow of uh, Venus. And in uh, 2015, Bill Knight, a science guy, had a chance to catch up with him again and uh, his advice, let's ramp it up. So. We're inspired by what happened at the Mars Curiosity rover, the way that the rover landed and moved. 
Um, we ran a project last year uh, with the students um, where we're actually building our own autonomous smart city. It's a project I'm looking at working on um, at Monash and being able to build upon. And I want you to remember what we do today all happened from those very early steps of a school that just had one web camera, <laughs> a school that had blocks of wood and a school that had maybe the passion inspiration to connect with the right kind of people and do the right things. That's my daughter, more hair. <laughs> Sometimes a smaller step in the right direction ends up being the biggest step of your life. Thank you. So um, I'll just let you in on a little secret before we start um, on our tour uh, and everyone comes back here. Um, I've known Roland for about 10 or 11 years now and I said to Roland uh, before uh, he came here tonight, you're going to have about 11 or 12 minutes to speak, Roland. And he said, yeah, okay, that's fine. And I said, do you mind just sending me your slides before you know, you, you, we talk? And he said, no, that's fine as well. So I did have to say I had my uh, heart in my mouth when I opened the slide deck and saw 69 slides. <laughs> Knowing Roland, how good he was, I thought that's even going to be a challenge for you. But I hope that you got something not only out of Roland's uh, this uh, presentation, but out of the presentation from all four people here tonight. So can you please join with me in thanking all four of our presenters. to the Victorian Space Science Education Centre. My name is Luca Bertolacci and I'm going to be taking you around all the different rooms that we have here at BCB, explaining how we use them and some of the programs that we run. Okay, let's head into the airlock. and nines, in particular year eight, because it teaches geology. It is essentially a geological field trip on Mars. We created this program to help us um, and help teachers teach geology in a real world and interesting way. Uh, lots of teachers at high school don't necessarily have a geological background, so they find the contents a bit intimidating. Um, and also, kids generally don't find rocks that interesting. So the whole point of this is to get kids interested in rocks, get interested in geology. Um, they come out here and they learn a whole stack of geology about plate tectonics and volcanics. So essentially what happens is the class will come in, usually a class of about 24, and we split them up into two halves. So one half will be the astronauts in the morning, uh, and the other half will be in our mission control. So the astronauts, they come out here, they get suited up, they get backpacks on, helmets, they get briefed on all the different roles. There's six different roles. There's uh, engineers, chemists, biologists, geologists, uh, physicists, and the commanders in charge of the entire mission. Um, they all have different uh, activities to do, different experiments to do. There is no set order as to what they have to do and how they do it. They can use all kinds of different tools, all kinds of different equipment. We do give them some guidance, and the most crucial thing is they are talking with mission control. They don't have to write anything down. They are talking with their two mission controls upstairs, getting information of what to do, and they're giving them all the data, all the information. So they're out here working for about 45 to 50 minutes. Um, we don't help them do anything. Usually they'll come up and say, what do I do next? And we respond with a question, what do you think you're supposed to be doing next? Who can you ask? And so they'll ask each other and ask the mission controllers, ask the commanders to work out what it is they're supposed to be doing. Um, each mission ends in a bit of a catastrophe, so there's either a solar flare or a dust storm. Um, the mission controllers are the ones that are given that information, so they've got to work on that information, work on that data, do the map to work out what time the, the astronauts are going to be in trouble and what time they have to get off, and they are the ones who decide when they can and can't come off the surface of Mars. 
So you can imagine mission control is pretty hectic, pretty, lots of screaming, but the astronauts generally don't know what's going on until the very last minute when they're told, get off now, you've got about two minutes before you die. Um, so they will get off and we'll take all their samples and stuff, and so they'll swap over. So each kid gets to be an astronaut, each kid gets to be a mission controller. They'll be looking after a different role when they're in mission control, so they don't necessarily know exactly what they're supposed to be looking for, which is nice because it means at, uh, in the afternoon session when they go into the lab, so they're simulating being a scientists back on Earth, looking at samples, they'll have a range of different samples because they would have collected from different areas, focused on different things, started at different points, um, and that's the key to this. So the idea is that we're in a crater here. Um, there's a whole stack of different stuff that we'll put out here. The most important thing is that each section of this crater is a different type of rock. So we have scoria, we have basalt, limestone, mudstone, sandstone. We have a nice riverbed going cutting through the middle. The idea is that by looking at these different types of rocks, and trying to work out the age, we can work out what environments were on Mars and at what times. So we put out other stuff here, so we put out dry ice, there's a heat mat underneath for the kids to look at. Um, they can use thermal cameras, they can use guide counters to look for radiation. They um, also have access to a whole bunch of other tools, um, and they have a weather station which they're monitoring the weather as well. So there's a whole bunch of things that they can collect whilst they're on the surface um, and take into the lab. So there's some of the technology that we use on the surface here. Obviously the backpacks. Now we used to use a um, big hulking computer, but fantastic technology that it is these days. We just use normal Android phones and we download um, a couple of free apps that allow them to use the Wi-Fi to talk with our mission controllers on the headset. So it's pretty straightforward, very, very simple, very, very cheap. Um, with a whole lot of effect, and we just use a couple of computer fans to blow some air into their helmets. Um, it does the job. They think they're on Mars. The other things they use, like I said, they use an infrared camera, they use a guide counter, they've got a digital camera to take set, uh, photo, photos of samples, they use an iPad to monitor the weather with an app that we've created that simulates Martian weather and mar Martian temperatures, seismic activity, they can measure that as well. Um, so we all, the joke we always say is when we say seismic activity, the kids think earthquakes, but we're on Mars, so it's a Mars quake, not an earthquake. Um, so really simple things apply um, in a way which they're not necessarily used to. Um, and that's kind of the key for us using the technology, is we use the technology to facilitate our teaching uh, of the content. So we don't necessarily teach them exactly what the technology is doing, we help them use it and by using it they will understand what the technology does and the best way to use it for themselves. Um, yeah. That's pretty much it. Thank you very much. We'll see you in the next one. Okay, welcome to Mission Control. It's pretty quiet in here which is a bit weird because normally it's buzzing with teamwork and yelling and screaming and all that kind of stuff. Um, this is where our other half our astronaut, of our astronauts, our mission controllers, are going to be sitting and looking after those astronauts on the surface of Mars. So, as you can see, there's a whole bunch of different screens here. They've all got a different role. I'm not going to go through them all because they're quite convoluted. Um, but the idea is that they're looking after a specific system and they're also looking after the astronauts on the surface. With their systems, every now and again, they'll get mathematical or scientific problems that they have to solve. They're pretty simple problems, but they're written in a way that they haven't seen before related to their role. So it takes them a bit of time to work out what the math or what the science is that they have to apply to it um, and get everybody in to give them a hand to actually solve the problem. Once they solve the problem, their system starts working again and they can continue on. They are also talking with their astronauts, getting information from them, helping them do their information. This is a nice piece of software that we've got here to help us do all that, um, but there's no reason why it um, can't be done in a classroom in terms of uh, actually working with those problems, problem solving stuff with real life problems. It's not as nice when it's written down on a piece of paper compared to a, a screen, but this is basically the way we're using our technology in here. The whiz bang stuff is fantastic. We have up here we put our screens of what the astronauts are actually doing on Mars. Um, they can set up a portable camera as well and, and tell them and show them exactly what's going on. 
And so they're able to communicate with their astronauts and see their astronauts most of the time. Every now and again we get glitches, they have to work out how to fix those and solve those as well. Uh, like I said, these guys are the ones that uh, fix all the problems and they fix the uh, big problem of whether there's a sandstorm or a solar flare occurring and they do all the maths with that. One of the key things with all the maths that we do in our programs is we don't expect kids to have to do the calculations themselves. Once they understand what it is that they have to do, they have calculators they can access, um, they can even Google it if they really need to. So we're not focused on actually doing the calculations, we get the technology to do the calculations, we're the ones that work out what calculations to do and what those calculations mean afterwards. Uh, so that's pretty much mission control. It's a lot of fun and it's a lot, lot busier than what it is right now. Welcome to our space lab. So this is a lab that is supposed to be situated on the surface of Mars. This is where our primary school groups come. So once again, school will bring in a class of primary kids, grade fives and sixes. Half of them will go into mission control, the other half will be astronauts. They're a little bit small to wear the backpacks and helmets and stuff and go out to the surface. So instead they are going to a prefabricated lab on Mars, which is where we are now. In this mission, they are doing a whole stack of different experiments about Mars, about the soil, about the water. So they filter water, they look at the differences between Mars rocks and meteorites. They work with a robotic arm. So there's a lot of little bits of equipment like stills and microscopes, um, scales and obviously robotic arm that have this technology component, but they're used to discover something, to find out something. So this is really about teaching uh, primary school kids how to do experiments, how to work as a team. They're also communicating with their mission controllers. One kid's using a headset, but most of them are using uh, just a chat server. So once again, uh, as you can see with most of our programs, the technology part really uh, ties into communication. And one of the big things that we have with our programs and our scenario-based programs is that communication uh, part of it. Being able to talk with somebody that you're not in the same room, room with, being able to give explicit instruction and give accurate detail is something that uh, we really encourage and we try to teach our students how to do that. Um, so in Mission Control, they're looking after a system much like our secondary Mars program uh, and they're also communicating with our astronauts. Each mission ends in a bit of catastrophe in here as well, so either a meteorite has hit where we store our uh, radioactive waste and there's radiation leaking into the lab, or there is an unknown virus uh, contaminating our water samples, so the kids have to evacuate extremely quickly, and you can imagine a bunch of grade fives and sixes uh, learning that they're about to die, and how <laughs> energetic and excited they all are. So, in which control for our primary Mars, they are looking after systems, problems happen with those systems as well. Um, the problems are just simple generic uh, questions about Mars, so it's a nice way for them to apply their knowledge. It's basically a test or a quiz that we do in here, and it allows the teachers to actually see, do they know the stuff about Mars, do they know the stuff about the solar system that they have hopefully been learning before they come and do the program. our research lab. Uh, this is where the astronauts will bring their data into the lab after they've been to Mars and it's also where we've uh, set up for our chemistry programs, our VCE, our year 11 and year 12 chemistry programs. Um, I'll talk about the Mars program first. So the idea is now they become scientists to be uh, back on Earth and look at those samples that they've collected. So some of the samples are collected, soil, rock, stuff like that. They'll use a range of different equipment and uh, different uh, experiments to try to work out what type of rocks they've got, how old they are, what the order of them are, um, how riverbeds get formed, how tectonic plates work, all that kind of stuff. And the really cool thing is we use some pretty high-tech um, equipment in here. So the Mars kids get to use the FTIR, they get to use the UV Viz uh, to, just, to work out what things are in the soils, uh, what type of rocks they've got. So they use all this uh, equipment and we don't necessarily go into detail about how the equipment works. We give them a general overview of what it will do and the information they get back, they then have to work with that to work out what they've got. 
one of the nice things about that is there is no hard or fast rules as to determining the, uh, the data set. So if they get a graph that looks a particular way, it's up to them to decide if that graph signifies that there's copper, if there's silver, if there's nickel in that soil sample. So they really have to use, work collaboratively, they really have to use their ingenuity to uh, bring everything together. And so the idea is by doing that, collecting all the information, they'll be able to work out a timeline of the different environments that are on Mars. They'll also be able to take this data back into school and analyze a little bit further, along with any photos that they've taken throughout the day. With our VCE chemistry program, so for our year 11, year 12, we're, we're looking at uh, analytical chemistry. Um, we have some very fancy equipment. Like I said, we have the UVVs, we have the FTIR. We also have a AAS, a GC, and a HPLC. If you don't know what those stand for, you're probably not gonna use them. Um, these are equipment that students wouldn't get to use unless they were in maybe third year of a chemistry degree. Um, the nice thing about this program compared to a lot of other programs is that when they use these machines, they are the ones who set up the samples, they are the ones who create the standards, they set up the machine, they turn it on, they run the program, they clean it, they use it, they put their samples through it, and then they get the data back. We don't do demonstrations here. There's nothing worse than putting a nice shiny object in front of a kid and saying, don't touch it. So if they can't use it, we don't use it. All of our machines here are teaching machines. We don't have to worry about using them for uh, analyzing any real samples. They are there to be used by the students. Sometimes they get broken, sometimes they need to be fixed. That's the nature of teaching technology. You have to allow students the ability to make mistakes with it. If it's too expensive to break, well, you probably shouldn't be using it in that way anyway. Um, so the year 11, year 12, they get to do all this stuff. They get all that data. Most teachers use this um, as a sack for their students, which is a nice way to actually do it because, like I said, they wouldn't be, have that chance back in the classroom. Um, there's a, I mean, there's a big investment with these kinds of machines, but I believe and we believe there's big reward for that. Uh, it sparks a bit of interest. The nice thing about all the, our programs is they are run by um, undergrad or postgrad students in science or engineering. In particular, the chemistry is run by honours PhD students in chemistry who are looking to maybe go into industry or go into, into research. Um, and it allows students in VCE a chance to communicate with people who are working in that field and see where they might be able to take that knowledge and take a degree in chemistry. Because there's not a lot of people that actually, that students interact with that have a chemical degree the chemistry degree um, and, and using it in the workforce. So it's a nice way for them to be able to get that bit of information. So those are the rooms that we uh, generally use. There are a few other nice special rooms and a few other programs that we haven't mentioned today. But these ones really show some of the ways we use technology in uh, the centre at VSEC. Okay, so here we've got our Mars rover. So this is a real working rover. We put this out on the surface of Mars. Uh, the idea being that any uh, class can be a mission control. So this is one done off-site, can be done remotely. You can bring your students in here and we do a whole bunch of activities in the morning. And then in the afternoon, they uh, go into mission control, half become scientists, the other half become engineers, and they have to map out where they're going to send this rover, what they're going to do with it, work out what their mission is going to be like. So the rover really does move around on the surface of Mars. The cameras above pick out where it is, um, looking at the lights on the top. It has a robotic arm that extends, and as you can see, this rocker bogey system allows our wheels to go over pretty much all terrain. Um, every now and again, it does get stuck a bit, and a Martian has to come out and give it a kick. But most of the time, it works pretty well. And so the kids, you know, work collaboratively, work as a team in mission control. Um, their screens are uh, just an online uh, website that, that they access to uh, look after their systems and work out what it is the mission is actually going to entail for them. So it's a really nice intro into robotics, it's a nice intro into the engineering behind um, these kinds of things, uh, to, into programming, and a broader scope of how do we apply these things uh, to a mission that's really, really detailed and thinking about all the different things that go into that. Thank you.